St. John the Philosopher here. We seem to be living in one of the most hyper-partisan periods in American history. Democrat versus Republican, left versus right, liberal versus conservative. It's an endless, knockdown, down drag-out, ideological fight to the death, 24-7, 365. I imagine most people would reflexively scoff at the notion that the two sides need each other. But I can assure you they most certainly do, and I'm going to explain why. America has just celebrated another Independence Day with speeches commemorating the day. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Parades in celebration of the people that safeguard our freedoms. And social media messages calling all of it cynical, self-serving, and in service to white supremacy. You might have guessed that the only major difference between this year and, say, a few years ago is who's president. To say America is divided in 2019 is a supreme understatement. Most people I know, myself included, have at least entertained the idea that if only everyone subscribed to their way of thinking, the country and in fact the world would be a better place. Now that's not entirely false. If everyone held to the same set of universal and transcendent values, at least, we would more easily be able to orient society towards a common ideal state. But in large part, that's not what people are thinking when they wish the other side simply didn't exist. The reality of it is that the world requires people that think differently from each other. Well, a particular kind of different anyway. A number of sociological and psychological studies have found that there are significant differences in temperament and thought process between those who tend to identify as liberal and those that tend to identify as conservative. Don't read the articles about them though. The journalists and pundits that write them often set out to cast their political adversaries in as bad a light as possible, muddying the waters. Sadly, sometimes the academic papers themselves do the same thing. In any case, it's important to note that these studies, like pretty much all sociological studies, don't make absolute determinations about groups of people. It simply makes a comparison of the prevalence of certain traits between those groups. So, for instance, a study says that women like chocolate more than men. It's not saying all women like chocolate, nor is it saying that men don't like chocolate. Do you want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. Just that a greater percentage of women like chocolate to a greater degree than men, on average. Life was like a box of chocolates. It's the same thing with these studies of political persuasion and temperament, so please keep that in mind as we go forward. Also, for the purposes of this video, I'm using the word left here, little l, to describe people with liberal political tendencies. I'm not talking about the left, big L, who are trying to destroy the country. That's a video for another time. Okay, so what I've found in these studies is that you can generally capture the biggest variances between the two political groups as being those prone to risk-taking on the left and those that are risk-averse on the right. Again, not that left-leaning people can't be risk-averse and right-leaning aren't risk-takers, it's just that one group is more of that than the other on average. Now, if you think about it, you can see both the positives and negatives of these distinct mindsets. Take, for instance, how each would have benefited a tribe of ancient humanity. The risk takers were always trying new things, experimenting, looking towards the horizon for the latest and greatest. Painting is a thing of the past. I call this a snapshot. Oh, let's do it again. I think I blink. We should move the whole community to the other side of the mountains, they might say. The risk averse, however, seeks security and stability. So once they've found something good, they want to guard and maintain it. We have food nearby. We have water and material resources right here. If we go over there, we could die, they might say. No, we don't know what's over there. Maybe nothing. It's too risky. As a compromise, they send a small scouting party to see what's on the other side of the mountains. This agreement would accomplish two things. It would establish that there was no way the community would survive a trip across the mountains and the scouting party would discover a material 
along the way called bronze. Clearly, if the risk taker's notion prevailed, the community would have died in a foolhardy journey in search of a mythical, better place to settle. If only the risk averse got their way, they may never have entered the Bronze Age and would eventually have been destroyed by the civilization next door that did. Another major difference between liberals and conservatives is that while conservatives tend to be more concerned with social order and justice, liberals tend to be more occupied with social welfare and mercy. Interestingly, it's the combination of these separate sets of priorities that allowed the old feudal systems of Europe to be transformed into representative democracies that balanced uh, until then unprecedented individual freedom with the widespread safety and stability once thought to be only possible under a powerful monarchy. Modern Western civilization is quite a bit more complex and has a completely different set of challenges than our ancestors, but the basic mentalities of its citizens are still about the same and still just as important. The modern American conservative is risk averse. She understands that our current success as a nation was built on a set of foundational ideas that have been refined and proven in the fires of human history. That defense of these ideas is, in effect, the defense of all those who benefit today and will benefit in the future from that system. The modern American liberal recognizes the imperfections in our institutions. He sees how people fall through the cracks and is driven to respond through systematic change. He wants to help people. Both of these positions are such that when taken together, they can be a true benefit to everyone. Where we run into some serious trouble is when one position is taken to the complete exclusion of the other. So to oversimplify, the extreme right position views the existing system as virtually infallible and that any attempts to change it would cause its destruction. All of this that you see before you is all your fathers and everything is thought out. Let's put everything back the way you found it. But dad, you don't understand. So I can make things the way they're supposed to be. Permanently. More craggles! I've never encountered someone who believes that, but I'm sure they're out there. The extreme left position is the belief that the system is rotten to its core and must be completely brought down. What's the problem? The whole damn system! What's the solution? Sadly, this is the mentality that seems to be very prevalent today on the political left, as displayed by figures in government media, education, and entertainment. In response to these widespread calls for radical dismantling of American institutions, moderate voices on the right that speak up in defense of those institutions are wrongly characterized as being like the extremists I discussed earlier, believing the system is perfect just the way it is. Couldn't be further from the truth, but when has truth really mattered to anybody in these days? What you get as a result is political tribalism, spiraling hyperbolic rhetoric on social media and extreme swings in government from one side to the other as those caught in the middle try to make sense of it all. So what can we do? Well, for starters, we need to take the primary message of this video to heart. We, liberal, conservative, left, right, whatever you wanna call us, we need each other. Your individual perspective of things necessarily has gaps. Your faith in the system may be misplaced in certain areas and your criticism of it may be misinformed. So no matter how wrong-headed or vitriolic your political opponent, assume there's a grain of truth somewhere deep down below the rhetoric that can inform the way you look at things. Yes, the value of our institutions and philosophies have been proven over generations. And yes, there are problems, some of them deep and abiding, that must be addressed if that proven success is to be made as universal as possible. If we approach each other in a way that allows the valid parts of each other's arguments to stand, maybe we can actually have the types of conversations necessary to keep civilization moving in the right direction. Tell me what you think of this video. What do you think about my belief that liberals and conservatives need each other? What will it take to get us to work together? Discuss in the comments. In the meantime, be sure to like, subscribe, and share for more videos on religion, culture, and politics. That's all for today. This is St. John the Philosopher. Goodbye, God bless, and I'll see you in another video.